Well, welcome everyone. Um, so we've had in Australia, Are You OK Day recently, and next week it's uh, Mental Health Awareness Week here in New Zealand. And the thing this sure. year is um, take time to court it all, which I think mm. is really cool. A little chat can go a long way. And this is a fantastic lead into our chat today with my guest, the great Siale Foliake. Um, <laughs> the great man. Now we'll be covering some of this amazing, his amazing expertise, advice, and also have some time for some questions. So just about that, if you want to throw a question into the chat, feel free. You know, I do things pretty, pretty loosely. I just said to Siali that, you know, I go down some rabbit holes, but that's all cool. So just before we start, Dr. Siali Alo Foliake is a consultant psychiatrist with County's Manukau District Health Board based at Middlemore Hospital in Odahu. And I guess you've got a few stories just about that, Siali. He shared the Tongan Youth Suicide Prevention Group, you legend. Toko Collaboration, and as a director of Vaku Tua Tua, is that Tau Tau, is that the best way to say it? Tau Tua. Tau Tua, Tau Tua, yep. there you go. A charitable trust providing health services and support to older people, people with disabilities, and those needing support with mental health. Siali was a lead psychiatrist for the development and national rollout of the Crisis Mental Health Service Project with the Ministry of Health. He's a fellow of the Australian and New Zealand College of Psychiatrists, and mm -hmm. is unique in having dual fellowship in both adult and child adolescent psychiatry. Siali is also on the clinical advisory group here at Mentamia. And um, how are you, mate? How's things? Like I was saying to people that I was incredibly anxious five weeks ago when we went into this um, lockdown because I was, um, I don't know, I just wasn't expecting it, but I had to put mm. my, you know, I had to put some extra care around my mental health. But yep. this time I'm a bit ho hum. I'm sort mm. of uh, flat. Mm. How are you? Well, if you'd, if you had asked me that question two weeks ago, um, I would have given you a different answer. You know, and two weeks ago I was kind of flat, energy levels were low, I was eating far too much, you know, just my own personal self cares kind of had fallen off a cliff. And I just thought to myself, what, what is going on? You know, there's, um, for a person like me trying to, you know, we, part of a, of a big system down at Minimal Hospital, a lot of people, um, you know, doing some really hard yards at the moment. And, you know, for, for us that have been given leadership responsibilities, you know, we, we're kind of, we have to bring a bit of energy and, a, and, a, and, a, and, and some, you know, some passion to our work to keep other people up, right? And so if you'd asked me that question two weeks ago, uh, you would have got a really different answer out of me. And so I thought to myself, I have got to um, do something about this. And so, you know, I made some changes at a personal level. And, you know, two weeks into those changes, I'm feeling in a much better space. So you, you've caught me on a good day, John. Oh, th that's beautiful because I'm pleased I caught you on a good day. Yep. <laughs> no, I, I think that's really, really interesting. I mean, for someone like you who, who studied and uh, two questions, really, yep. How, how do you sit with those emotions and readdress them from a personal point of view yep. when you've done the study? So how do you, how do you make that link? Because oh, really we all break our own rules, right? I say, oh, we've got a really strong daily uh, mental health plan, but yep. often I do break those rules. You look, I, um, so I, I'm a bit like you, John. I don't know. Um, we've never had this conversation before, but you know, there is a structure and a process that can help you maintain your your, your well being. You know, well being isn't an accident. You don't trip over it. You know, and you you know you fall down the stairs and you, you stand up and you think, shit, I'm feeling really good now. Do you know what I mean? So something you know, well being is something that you've got to put some effort in. And you know, and we all, you know, all of us are trying to. None of nobody gets up this morning and thinks, I want to have a terrible day today. I'm going to do everything I possibly can to have a shit day. Excuse my French, right? <laughs> we all wake up and we're all we're all wanting to have a good day. Um, and, you know, from a, from, a, from a doctor perspective, we think there are certain things that are more likely to give you that outcome, and there are, there are other things that are less likely to give you that outcome, right? And then you turn that into this thing called clinical psychology, clinical psychiatry, because for a, for a percentage of the population, the challenges of life, you know, are so difficult that they start to experience things that you have diagnosable mental disorders, right? But then for the majority of us, we don't quite get there, but, you know, we have miserable days. And so if you think about structure and process, I keep a journal, you know, I, I, I think about my emotions and I like to label my emotions and give it some thought as to, hey, why am I feeling this way today when I wasn't feeling this way yesterday? And I, and I think, do you do something similar? 
Yeah, look, I, I um, and there's just been a really, really good uh, question just thrown up. Any ideas on how to deal with lockdown? I can't cope with this lockdown stuff anymore. It's becoming yep. extremely overwhelming. Yep. And um, I think this is really interesting to, to investigate because I, I feel the same as that question sometimes. Yep. But when, when I was really unwell, everything was overwhelming. And what I learned to do was actually put my, my life into daily um, practices. So I actually don't worry about yesterday and I don't worry about mm. tomorrow. What I do do is try and be the greatest me that I can be today. Right? And, and so I have a really strong daily mental health plan. I also have, um, I also have a, um, you know, a worry map. So my worry map is what I can control, what I can't control, what I can do and what I can't do, right? Because I can't control COVID. I, I, I can't, um, you know, ring Jacinda and say, can you please make this level two because I've had a guts for. But what I can control is my daily output and my daily understanding of how to look after me. How, how do you do it when you get a little bit overwhelmed? Oh, look, I... Um... And I'll answer that question from a personal point of view and hopefully address the question that's being asked. You know, somebody in our audience is saying, hey, your lockdown's doing their head in, right? They're just, they're just getting to that point where, where, where they can't cope. And, you know, I think that's an experience that we're all going to have moments of that experience. And if, if that experience pushes on and you're feeling that, you know, every minute for the entire day, that's a seriously bad day. Right? And so if you were to ask me, you know, what, 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 what gives me, how do I cope? Um, oh man, I'm going to sound like a doctor now. I don't really want to sound like a doctor. You know, um, structure really matters. Do you mean, I, I think that you've got a bit of a plan for how, you know, the activities that you've got planned for the day, I think that's kind of ahead of you. And I'd like to think that some of those activities are going to bring you some, some joy. I, I hope that this activity, that, you know, us spending some time together, having a chat and talking about the things that are working for, for us both, I'm hoping we enjoy that process. And so if I go back a step, you know, that person that's really struggling today with this lockdown thinking, shit, I don't know if I can get through another day. Rather than think about the entire day, if they were to break their day down into little elements and have at least something to look forward to this morning, something to look forward to in the afternoon, something to look forward to in the evening, um, that would be great. And, you know, what am I looking forward to? I'm really looking, for, I was looking forward to this chat. And so okay. that cheered me up. You know, when I woke up this morning, I was looking forward to it. And so some little things to look forward to and some structure in the day. There's so much, there is so much more advice that I could give, but just we'll just go one or two things at a time. Yeah, and, look, and, and I think um, we all feel like this. So one thing that I learned to do, and I, I want to investigate this, because sometimes when I explain things, I don't explain them too well, but I call it sitting with my emotions. Right, so right. I've felt overwhelmed as well. So don't actually judge that. Um, emotion like it's okay I'm going to be overwhelmed I'm going to I'm going to be overwhelmed again in a few weeks or, we, or tomorrow whenever that is I don't but I don't judge that emotion I go well that's normal we're in COVID we're in lockdown let it let it go through I love that cup by the way can you just show me that cup oh mate my um my daughter gave this to me it's my favorite cup I use it all the time I didn't mean to I didn't purposely I you this is my cup that every time I have a cup of tea this is the cup I want to have a cup of tea out so, so, you know, don't judge your emotions. It's okay to be overwhelmed. But I think what I do is I've got something to look forward to tonight. And yeah. you know what I'm looking forward to tonight? It's as simple as this, Yali. I am going to try and make homemade KFC. Oh, okay. I'm going to try and do it, right? Okay. And, and, and it's really interesting because only in New Zealand do you get gang members trying to bring $100,000 across <laughs> the border and a boot full of KFC. But, but I'm actually looking forward to that. That's what yep. I'm looking forward to today. It could be a disaster, but yep. it'll be fun doing that. So that's when I okay. say sit with your emotions. Don't judge feeling overwhelmed. It's okay. Yep. It happens, right? Yeah. And it's funny that you should say that. Good luck with the KFC. You'll have to let the rest of us know how you go. <laughs> Um, you know, if you think about um, looking forward to something and whether it goes well and doesn't go well, that, that's a really important thing to have in your day. I guess, you know, there's this inverse law in health, right? You know, you think about that, that, that question we got from somebody out there in our audience that um, that person needs the KFC meal more than potentially some other people, right? But at the time when you need it most, when you, when you, when you, when you, when you probably need a little bit of fun and enjoyment to break up your day, it's, 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 and this is where we've got to have some compassion. For some people, John, um, the situation they find themselves in, the hardest thing that they can do today is actually have some fun. And, and that part, you know, as, as, as a person and as a doctor, I, I struggle with, with a wee bit, you know? 
Yeah, and I think um, there's a there's a really there's a really interesting uh, question here. I'd like to know what you guys think employees can do to normalise realistic and honest responses to how are you. Wow. And I wanted to talk to you about two things about checking in. I, I say this that most New Zealanders, when you ask them, don't give you an honest response. We're always okay. How are you? Yeah, no, I'm great, mate. Yeah, fantastic. You know, all good. That's true. And, and so what I say is to, to start building that. Um, that safe psychological bridge to someone, I always say, ask twice. No, hmm. how are you really? And it takes a little bit of time, but yep. you create trust. I mean, how do you check in? And firstly, in your world, and then how, you know, with, there's been a lot of discussion about Pacifica yep. and some of the things that Pacifica are really missing at the moment, like the church and, and the community. How would you do that in the, in the Pacifica way to check in on another Pacifica family member that's yeah. missing that you know I, I was talking to Ronnie Clark yesterday and we're talking mm -hmm. about you know I'd say to any Palangi in this world if you ever get yeah. the chance to go to a feed after church on Sunday with a Pacifica family <laughs> it's the greatest thing you'll ever do um, <laughs> but you know that, it's hard at the moment so two questions I guess you know checking in genuinely at work and then how would you be checking in especially um, in the Pacifica community that that yep. their connection is around community and church you know, it's really interesting, right? Do you know your 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 strategy of checking in twice, right? You know, from a from a Polynesian worldview, um, that would really make us laugh. So, for example, <laughs> if you said, "How are you, Siali?" I'd say, "Yeah, I'm good." And if you said to me, "Siali, how how are you really?" Do you know what I mean? My reaction to that would be, I'd laugh, John, because I, I I wouldn't know whether you with it because I wouldn't know whether you're taking the piss out of me. You know what I mean? So, so my, my reaction would be, is John being serious? And if I felt like you're being serious because, you know, you, that was kind of, I knew you well enough to know that you were asking me a serious question because you were showing some concern and some kindness. Yeah, I would respond appropriately. You know, I, I would tell you how I'm feeling. Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing, you know, openness versus closeness. There, is, there are certain attributes in psychology that we think are much more likely to, to give you a happy life, right? And openness is one of those qualities, right? Versus being closed. So if somebody asks you a question, your, your, re your reaction could be, why is he asking me that question? You can have a suspicious response, right? That speaks to a, a personality attribute where you might be a bit closed, right? You're a very open person. So the research says you're more likely to enjoy your interactions today, John, by being a little bit open, right? And the Polynesians is a cultural worldview. We're much more open than we are close. So if you know, if you if you walk past a Polynesian family and you know and you say hello, they're they're likely to invite you in for for for, for a cup to, to have dinner, to have some KFC, right? So you know that 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 openness. All the research says that there are certain att human attributes that are much more aligned with being happy. And openness is one of those attributes. But we'll go back because there was a question. I want us to answer some of the questions. The question was about how can an employer... Can you read that question again, John? Yeah, I'd like to know what you guys think employers can do to normalise realistic and honest responses to how are you. I've experienced companies that expect people to just be positive and don't give space for us to just speak frankly. It turns... Uh, it, in turn, it turns just forces us falsely to each other, create unrealistic you know, expectations. Sure, that's one. Excuse my French. That's one hell of a question. So, um, I always bring back that quality of sincerity. If an organization, if an organization or an employer, if they're genuinely sincere when they ask that question, then the people asking the question, you're talking about management level now. Yeah, if you're going to ask that question, you 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 you, you better make sure that you do it from a really sincere and authentic place because we we've all got bullshit antennas, right? If somebody asks you a question and it's some sort of PR exercise, yeah, or some sort of management 101, hey, this is a good way to interact with employees so you get productivity, you get the opposite. You, you, you get cynicism, you get pessimism, you get, you know, um, oppositional um, behaviors from people because you're not being genuine. So, so my advice is call it when you see it. If you're an employee, you know, and a manager sincerely asks you, like you, you, you just did then, you know, how you are. And it's a sincere, sincere question. Um, give them some positive feedback on that, right? But if you get another bloke, another manager, that it's not sincere, um, my advice is, if you, you know, you don't always have to call people on it because sometimes you just want to get on and answer your emails. But, um, you know, it does, it does um, behove us to call out interactions where people aren't being sincere.
And then I'll finish off the, call, the question you asked me about Polynesians and, and our well-being. You can always tell when Polynesians are well. You don't have to ask them how they are. By the, um, by the, um, the joy that emanates from them. So, you know, from a psychiatric point of view, we talk about transference and counter-transference, fancy words. But essentially, John, you're giving off emotions today. And another human being can feel it, right? And so when I'm around my community, often I don't need to ask the question because you can feel and we tend to, you know, live in a really collective way. So you get a, like, you know, your, your wife, your children, think about it. You, you can tell when your son's off color, pick up the phone. First word that he says to you, you don't have to ask him, you hear it. Do you know what I mean? And so it's much more about, I think the, the, the response and the question is about really paying attention. If we pay more attention during times of difficulty, you, you, you'll know without having to ask. No, that's really, this, this, so, um, you know, my, my brother-in-law, Samoan, so I've been Samoa a lot, been to Tonga a couple of times, been to Fiji a lot. Yep. Um, and the first thing that happens when you're playing and um, you score a try, there's a there's a polite clap. Someone gets smashed, there's a chair <laughs> and a laugh. And um, and so just get it, so just getting back to this, can you can you explain in the face of adversity, often Pacifica go to humor or laughing yeah. at it you know like yeah. i said to you and, and, and it was great to see you smile when i said well how are you Siale? like you just laugh at me like like all my pacifica friends would yeah. so i mean what what is that and how do we actually connect a wee bit deeper sincerely because um you know there is this laughter how do you can because what you said is connect really emotionally so you need yeah. to be aware that's not easy yeah. huh? So if, if I was to use psychological terms to describe what comes quite naturally, because I think that it is um, role modeled for children, yeah? um, we don't filter our reactions. And so what you get is quite an unfiltered response from a collective group of people, right? What makes us laugh is quite universal, right? You know, like if somebody falls over, you know, if somebody trips over, we can't help ourselves across. It's a universal reaction. We all laugh. Do you know what I mean? And it seems so, um, that seems, it kind of feels awful at one level, right? Why do we laugh at somebody, you know, if somebody does something that is slightly humiliating or, you know, they have an accident? I think there must be some um, universal responses to, to us as human beings that um, mean that that raw, that raw, unfiltered reaction is the most honest. And so what you're describing is kind of um, unfiltered, raw emotion. And, you know, like when I watch New Zealand crowds cheer on the All Blacks, do you know what I mean? And if you, if you, if you watch the, the Tongan Matima Tonga, you know, the MMT guys, you know, and, and, you, and you compare the enthusiasm for what's happening out there, I think that you know, New Zealanders, it must be a cultural thing, are a little bit more reserved. But I, I think that that reservation is, 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 it's kind of, I think it's beautiful in its own way. Do you know what I mean? And I, and I think, you know, sometimes that raw emotion, expressed raw emotion, I think it's, um, it's beautiful in a different way. But, but I think, yeah, that I don't know if I'm answering the question, but just kind of describing what I see. No, you are. I, and I think, um, you know, I, I spoke to Tofinga, um, yep. and he's doing a lot of work, in, in, especially in that um, upper youth space. Yep. And, you know, there's a lot of work to be done with Māori and Pacifica. I mean, that, like I say, mental health is not prejudice, but our stats in that area are not good. I mean, how do we communicate with Pacifica youth? How do we, because I, I, I imagine it, it, that they are torn between two cultures often. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. How, do we, how do we break down those barriers to, to make it acceptable, and especially in Pacifica? Yeah, look, um, and I, I think what I'm what I'm about to say, I think it applies whether you're you know come from a Pacifica Polynesian background, if you come from a, you know, I've, I've got some friends from Croatia, grew up with some Croatians, and they're they're a volatile emotional bunch, those Croatians, and I love the enthusiasm that they have for life, right? Um, so if you think about it from a cultural perspective, the question that you're asking is, you, you know, young people. Um, if you think about our age group now, right, we're in our 50s and you want to talk to a 16, 18, 20 year old, right, what they respond well to, everybody responds well to humor if it's sincere, and everybody responds well to concern that's sincere, and it comes back to what I said earlier, sincerity matters, yeah, authenticity matters, and that crosses um, mm. age groups, 
and it crosses cultural groups. You can always tell when you're dealing with somebody that firstly, you can tell within a few sentences or just a small interaction, the extent to which they really care about what's happening for you in that moment in time. And if you can you know, lift their spirits, often humor is the way to go. But sometimes if you get humor wrong at a time when you know something's really serious and you make light of it, sometimes that can really cause harm. So that speaks to a level of sophistication sometimes that we mm. can bring to bear if we ourselves aren't too busy, too stressed, too tired. Do you know what I mean? I think those are natural attributes we all possess. Um, so, you know, again, you know, make sure that you're in a good space when you're trying to communicate with, with youth. I mean, there are other answers. That's a complex question, John, you know, and, and yeah, I'm trying is. to answer that, the question more from a sort of a broad base rather than getting down into the detail. But Yeah, like, I think this is really important because there's a lot of people out there who really really care and sometimes we just don't know hmm. um, people don't know how to make you know how to make that first approach or actually how to help so yep. you know I think I think talking about it understanding it even broadly is important to start building those bridges I've got a, I've got a really good question here because the, the, the other thing I had to think about the other day was um, how different COVID is for everyone. Some people are incredibly busy. Some people are zoomed out. Some people are, you know, frontline. Mm -hmm. Some people level three means they can go back to work and start earning money for their families. for their families, which is which is absolutely awesome. But there's a question here: How to keep yourself busy during this period when you can't meet people and you can't go overseas? Wow. Mm. How to you keep yourself busy? Mm. <clears throat> I'll, I'll ask you the question. How, how would you answer that question? Because I'm about to answer it from a clinical perspective. I'm intrigued just from a... Okay. From, yeah. from a personal point of view, I realise that COVID is taking a lot away from me. Okay. Right? My family, my wife's overseas. I lost my father-in-law. Uh, my mother-in-law's not well. My daughter's overseas with my son, Nico. I haven't seen Nico for two years. My other son is living in Karapiro. So I haven't seen him for a while. So COVID and look, We've all got those stories. So I don't feel sorry for him, not worried about that. But what, what I decided to do was, what am I going to take from COVID? And I decided that it was going to be education, um, not in the formal sense, but I was going to spend more time reading. Um, I'm, I've taken up the guitar, Siali. I'm terrible. Even the dog leaves the room when I play. <laughs> but, but, but I am doing things. I um, also got back on my push bike in the garage. I've got a machine. So I've, I've done three things. I'm going to um, learn some stuff around breathing. So I'm doing a whole lot of different breathing techniques. Um, I'm spending a little bit more time with the guitar because I can. And I'm also taking fitness. So that's what I'm taking from COVID because it's taking from me. So that's how I keep myself busy. And I do that on a daily basis, right? Like you say, routine for me is really, really important. Absolutely. And for me, there is no tomorrow. I yes. will face tomorrow. Um, tomorrow. Later on tonight, I'll say, okay, what have I got on from a work point of view? Then I'll plan my day. And the time is going relatively fast for me because of those things. So when I come out of this, you know, I might be able to play jingle bells on the guitar. Yes, <laughs> yes, but, yes. But you know what I mean? I'm, yep. And I think that's how I'm dealing with it. And I don't know if that's a, you know. It's really interesting because the question to us both was, how do I fill my day? Do you mean when so much has been taken away by COVID that I can't have those interactions that, that I've always had? And your response was really interesting. Um, you're filling your day with things that potentially you would never have been able to push into in the busyness of your normal life, right? So it's a really fascinating response because to the person that answered the question, I wonder if, ever, if there was a musical instrument that they ever, ever felt that they wanted to learn. You know, was there a, um, a book that they'd always wanted to read that never got a chance to read? You know, maybe there's an opportunity in COVID that if we, if we, turn, the, if we turn it upside down, um, and ask ourselves the question, what's really important to us? And does COVID give me an opportunity to push in some of those things that are important to me that I've never had the, the opportunity to push into? So I really liked your response. There's an amazing question here. What are some good tools to help staff when we have lost a member of the team? Ooh. Ooh. Okay. All right. Um, So, so I, I'll, I'll give you my professional response first, and then I'll give you my personal response. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So my professional response is um, um, knowledge is really powerful. 
And, um, you know, I've had over the course of my working life, I've had to deal with families and individuals that have experienced grief, you know, and the, and the sort of grief that is, that is um, profound because, you know, losing a family member before their time and sometimes losing family members in tragic circumstances and having to work through that. And I know that when you explain to people, you know, the types of experiences that they're going to have in their grief, you know, the denial that they're going to initially experience that it's not happening to them, right? the anger that we all experience at a loss that was unexpected, yeah, and the bargaining that we do, these, these types of things. And to be honest, you're never going to get through grief without allowing the sadness to sit with you. And so much of our activities, particularly in the modern world, is actually to keep sadness at bay. Mm. Do you know I mean, we do so many things to distract ourselves. And there is a time and place to feel sad because if we don't allow ourselves to process sadness we never get to that point where we lift out where, where we come back to to you know we have to get to a point of acceptance because there are so many things that are beyond our control and acceptance is ultimately the kind of place we all have to get to when when when, when things like tragedy occurs mm. and so from a from a clinical point of view helping people to understand what it is that they're about to go through and when they're going through it to know that that was expected and was going to be part of the process um I know that that's really powerful because I've seen it at work. Yep. At a at a personal level, there are things that, and I guess from a from a Polynesian worldview, um, when we talk about faith, you know, often we associate that with religiosity, but not always. You know, it's it's and, and a religion gives us the rituals and the structures, but faith is a is an interesting phenomenon because in faith there is hope. And so at a personal level, I fall back on those things. And I find myself, I play my guitar a lot when I'm sad. Yeah, you can always measure my sadness by how often I've got my guitar in my hands, right? Um, because it comforts me. Um, I wish I could sing, John, you know, because I can't, I'm, I must be one of the You're few. You're Tongan, bro. You can it, sing. You're Tongan. Well, I must You're be being one of humble. Few few Polynesians that can't sing well and so you know so I, I like it when other family members are around because if you str if you str strum a song they'll sing it well for you so this <laughs> lockdown means that I haven't got many vocalists it's just me and my guitar on my lonesome but um that's a professional and personal response yeah I think um if, if I can answer that I, I, I personally um so I've unfortunately been in the aftermath of suicide um talking to people and it's it's an illness that kills um unfortunately it does and i don't know if this was a suicide but it leaves a lot of guilt behind it leaves a lot of what ifs um what, what if i had done this what if i had done that what did i last say to them could i have done better a lot of anger a lot of whole lot of different emotions than yeah. um, the normal sadness of death and what i say is that that person died of an illness Mm. and that illness mm. kills i had it and i survived mm. and i'm very fortunate for that mm. um and so the other th the only other personal thing i can explain is when my dad died um mm. you know he'd had heart issues um but the first day he died i couldn't believe it mm. i could not believe it i thought he was going to sit up and go haha because dad had a bit of a funny <laughs> sense of humor you know um and then the second day um i thought I was angry. Why didn't we, re I mean, he'd had three triple bypasses and we all agreed that he shouldn't be revived. He was 84, but I was really angry. Why didn't we, we shouldn't have signed that thing. We should have let him, let the, the ambulance, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. Revive, revive him. And I was really angry. Um, and this, I'm not, I'm saying these in days, but this took a little while. The third day I went into, I wasn't a good son. I was away a lot. Um, you know, I, I could have been a better son. So there was all this guilt and then the, the then the fourth emotion was um, I actually need to accept these and celebrate Dad and what would he want? And there was two things I decided to do. My dad would want me to carry on, and he'd want me to be happy and he'd want me to have a great life. And the second thing, and I did this both with my mum and dad. What can I? They say people live on within us. So what can I take from him yep. that was one of his great attributes and bring it into my my person and that gave me that gave me those four emotions and then gave me a goal to say okay what was dad's greatest attribute and can i bring that into my daily life and you know i'll give you one example um read my mother you know my mother was an amazing lady as well she passed away four years ago now when we had a funeral people came up to me and said jk 
um, we loved your mum. I said, I love my mum. You know, why do you love my mum? They said, oh, she gave us time. Mm. Mm. And I promised on my mum's death mm. that I would give people more time. Mm. And is that hard sometimes? Yeah, because yeah. time can taken away from you. But my mum gave people time. And so the, the grieving process for me was that right? Um, sit with those emotions. It's okay. It's okay. Um, tell your staff it's okay to, to, to feel angry. It's okay to feel that oh, I wish you had done more or, you know, was I a good workmate? But they are emotions that you need to actually, you know, you, when you meet someone, say, oh, and this is, this, is, this is JK data, I call it JK data because it's got no education behind it. But, you know, when I meet someone who's bitter from something that happened way back in the past, yeah. you know, I sort of say, you got to grieve shit and move on, you yeah. know? Yeah. So that's how I yeah. would sort of talk about it. You know, it's, what's really interesting, Doug, is during those different stages that you identified, you know, on the day that you were feeling quite angry about it all, and if somebody said to you, hey, you know, you need to think about what your dad would want for you and, and you know, his good attributes on the day that you were being angry, sometimes it doesn't kind of go down as well as if they said that to you on the day that you were feeling like thinking about what your dad wanted for you. Mm. And so, you know, my only, and again, it's, I guess it's the doctor in me. Mm. Um, it's, you know, having the, the ability to kind of, um, and if, this is a really tricky thing, JK, right? It's really tricky to know, um, what we can say to each other and get the timing right and and, yeah. and, and timing does better yeah and look Jada, this is really really important and i'm i'm reading a book at the moment called the confidence gap and it's a really mm. interesting thing to come back to so sitting with your emotions and not there's a lot of people out there's a lot of like i, I talk about this Sally. you know i don't know whether i should um eat a cow eat the vegetable garden you know be Palio, Julio, or Julio. I mean, I don't know what to eat anymore because every day you get all this information, <laughs> right? <laughs> so you get all this information and it's the same thing in the modern world. You know, there's, there's all the things about vaccination, yeah. all this sort of stuff. And what, yeah. I, what I say is that, you know, um, God or Allah can be the judgment of that. And I think one of the things I've learned in life is don't react to my anger emotions. Sit with it for 24 yeah. hours. I mean, yeah. I remember my dad saying to me, you know, if you're pissed off with someone, write them a letter, but then put it in the drawer and read it the next day. Mm. And I try and do that with my emotions and read it the next day. And if you still agree with it, send it. Mm. And, and I try and do that with my emotions. Like yesterday, I was incredibly um, flat and, and, and frustrated with level three. I just want to be in level two, right? And I'm thinking another two weeks. Yeah. But I, I sat with that and said, that's okay. And this morning I got up and I said, okay, what's the plan? So, you know, what, what, what do you do about those, those emotions like anger? What do you do with them? Mm. Do you, a professional and personal response? Yeah, totally. I love that. I love that both response. Aren't they molded into one? Or did you have mm. two brains like me? One talks to the other. Oh. Says, Good morning, Siali. Good morning, Dr. Siali. How are you? Well, you know, for example, I'll go to work and, you know, families can come into the office at war. We're doing some family therapy and I'm giving great advice. It sounds great. It feels good to be able to give that advice. You see it having an impact on families. Then I'll come home and my daughter will say something that's a little bit disrespectful. And in Polynesian culture, she shouldn't talk to her father that way. And it's hammer and tongs, man. And all of this advice that I've been giving, you know, for the first eight hours of my day, um, everything that I said, I do the opposite of. And so... You know, what I don't want to convey to, to our audience is that, um, you, you know, the, the professionals you see are human beings as well. Do you know what I mean? And I, I know from a theoretical point of view what I should say about anger. Um, but at a personal point of view, you know, I think uh, it's taken me a long time to um, come to terms with anger. So as a, as a culture, and I'll speak about Tongan culture, Tongan culture teaches us from a very young age to repress, to repress our emotions so that we can control them. Yeah, because I think that the community must know we're, we're kind of volatile, that we must have a set of rules that help us keep our emotions in check, right? But then certain things happen that trigger those emotions. And we're the most peace loving people in the universe. But, you know, if we feel something, if we've been wronged in some way, you know, we can become very homicidal very quickly. Well, maybe I shouldn't say it to that extent, but, you know, we can lose our emotions and, and be very strongly. And, and so if I come back to the notion of, you know, what do we do that from a professional sense? Anger often represents that other aspects of our lives go back to well-being. You know, we're less likely to, to experience a really strong, intense emotional reaction if we've had enough sleep. 
you know, if we've done a little bit of exercise, if we've, we've, you know, played a little bit of the guitar, we've read a good book, you know, we've had a nice dinner with our family. I would go back to um, do all the little things well, but there is a, there is a percentage of people in our community, John, if you, if you saw their circumstances, you'd be angry too. Yeah. You know, there is, there are things that happen to human beings that um, there is, there are trauma, there, there are traumatic circumstances and events that occur in all our lives that make it much more hard, it makes it much more difficult to, to keep our emotions in check when we when we do come across injustice or you know prejudice or you know um, somebody belittling us in, a, in, a, in an interaction. It's really hard to maintain manage those emotions if other aspects of our lives, particularly historical things, have um, make it difficult for us. Yeah, and I think. Um... You know, there's this beautiful saying, and I was just looking, I was just shuffling through my papers, and I lose it every day. But um, I'll, 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 I, I spoke um, to someone the other day, and for me, it was, it was, there was a saying saying that um, modern male has um, modern male has a this uh, an old an antique perception of what masculinity is that does mm. not sit in mm. the modern society. And I think that mm. is so true. And I think what I try and do, and I don't know what you think of this, because I'm actually using this as a free psychological session saying, so send me, <laughs> send me the invoice, Charlie, send me the invoice, brother. <laughs> Happy to pay. Um, you know, the, the things that I do around that is, is I don't judge. I don't judge me. And I don't, what I try and do is take that emotion and go, well, what's the best, you know, the best way forward. Okay. And like, it's, it's okay sometimes we are living in this unbelievably difficult world so those things are okay but also I think perception some of the things that got me really unwell was my perception of how I should be yeah. as a male yeah. my perception of how I should be as a person and yet yeah. those perceptions are often wrong from the society we grow up on yeah. and in and I think those things have changed so drastically now yeah. so how do you sort of deal with those conflicts of how you're being brought up how how you're supposed to react to how you would like to react and should react um that's really John that's a really complex thing you've just asked me it's a, it's a hell of a question right because if you think on one hand when you know, think about 1960s 1970s New Zealand when we were growing up right the rules around gender were really clear to us right but as we become a really liberal society and much more tolerant of differences um which i think is a fantastic thing um actually the, the rules aren't so clear okay mm -hmm. and i think when the rules aren't so clear i think it, that's that's that for a period while people um while while young people are discovering who they truly are and how they want to be in the world i think that's an incredibly anxiety provoking time mm -hmm. You know, because they're, they're given the freedom to kind of express themselves in a way that's different to how they might have been allowed to express themselves in the past, which kind of is more containing. But I think that's a much more repressive society. A whole mm. lot of young people are repressing emotions and experiences that they would have liked to have. And I think that causes its own difficulties. But let's not let's not th um, think that by being more liberal, that it doesn't create its own set of challenges. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as you go through this extended period of trying to discover how you are, who you are and how you want to be in the world and some of the conflict that that creates with some people that aren't so tolerant. Um, I don't know if at all if that answers the question because you asked me a personal question about, about how I manage. Mm. Manage specifically. Go back because I've lost the question in my... Oh, it, it was just like I have some, some ways that I do with things that I do with those raw emotions right. that I don't judge anymore. So I've learned to, and I call it sitting with it. So, yep. you know, for example, I give myself a break, yep. right? And I put that letter in the drawer and I'll address it tomorrow. Yep. So, you know. Because what, you, what you're really describing in psychological terms, to, to what extent you understand, the last thing you do, because when I say it out loud, you'll know that's exactly what you're doing, right? Um, I really love um, what Carl Rogers has to say. Carl Rogers is a psychologist that Time Magazine says, if you're going to read, he was number five in the top 10 people you should read his ideas from the 20th century. And he basically says that when once we've had enough to eat and we've, you know, if it rains, we don't get wet because we've got a reasonable accommodation and things. And he says human beings aspire to be the best that they can be without really fully recognizing it. And he put this fancy term together. He said, that's what we call self-actualization, right? Which Polynesians would find really interesting because we're not really interested in self-actualization we're much more interested in, in collective well-being right thinking about you know like if and i know this for you for you must be true like if, if your son's not well as a father you're not well 
Do you know what I mean? And so our collective well-being, but this notion of actualization, being the best we can be, to, to achieve that, you need a certain level of self-awareness. When I, when I listen to you speak, your, your level of self-awareness that I think is so protective in terms of understanding what it is that um, you do in response to stress or in response to you know, difficulties like this period we're going through, that level of self-awareness is what you've been nurturing and fostering for years now. And, and I think there's something in that. So there's a, there's a good question here, but I want to elaborate on it because and tell you a couple of things that's going on in, in, in my personal psychology. And I'm sorry, people, you know, I'm getting a free session from Saudi at the moment. <laughs> so well, welcome to the journey. No, seriously, I can relate to lockdown claustrophobia in Melbourne here. have just been feeling like I'm on autopilot here and dealing with my coming to terms with it and deciding that autopilot is completely okay. So I totally agree, man. You're just dealing with the best and make peace with your autopilot. But what I wanted to ask you was how... Uh, so I have not been back to a swimming pool since last lockdown. All right. I haven't been back to a gym since yep. last lockdown. And I don't know why. There's no logical reason why I shouldn't, right? So right now, I'm starting to analyze what's going to be the psychological hangover for me yep. when I go out this door. And I am, I mean, I'm walking, I live in Mission Bay. I'm walking Mission Bay. People are going out on the road to avoid, yeah, yeah, to avoid you. Yep. Some have, some have masks, others don't. You know, I went yep. out yesterday, I forgot my mask and I got halfway around the block. Oh, my mask. You know, people are doing all this sort of stuff. Yep. So there will be different emotions. If you're a frontline worker right now or, or a carpenter, whoever's allowed back to work at level three, what do you do with some of those fears? We don't have to be specific about them sure. when you're actually walking out that door because we've got used to COVID. We might not like it, but there's things yep. we've got used to. So how do, yep. how do I deal with those fears that might come from these different levels? Okay. We'll go to professionally you, and personally. Yeah, I'll give you the professional one first because I find it hilarious when I'm walking around and you know everybody's doing that, right? So um, when you think about somebody walking around you in that way, they're not trying to avoid you because they've got some sort of weird, you know, if, if in normal life, if you're walking down the street and somebody does that, you think, shit, what's going on, right? Forget COVID, walking down the street and people start avoiding you. You'd start thinking, holy moly, something's really wrong with me, right? But in COVID times, because it makes absolute sense, yeah, that tends to alleviate anxiety. So, you know, my response to the question is, if we can make sense of what's going on, yeah, if we can rationalize that um, and, and we can find logical reasons for why the things that are happening around us are happening, even lockdown, there are rational, logical reasons why, you know, we, we, we lot, le, level four, level three, and that person in Melbourne, I'm really intrigued by the ability they've got to accept their circumstance, which is, I think, something where peace of mind comes from acceptance, right? And so, so, so my response to your question is, if we can understand it, it reduces our anxiety. If we can't understand it, it you know, if we don't find a, a logical, rational reason, and that's why logic and rational thinking, it does help us. And we've got a challenge, you know, we've got to, when, when somebody says, like, my, my niece rang me from Sydney, she wants to know, she doesn't want to get vaccinated. We had this really funny conversation about vaccination. And she had some really illogical, irrational ideas about the vaccination that I wanted to challenge gently. So, and we should challenge some of our rational ideas. We should do that. It's good for us. And come to a position where, and I think acceptance is about, well, not always, but to a certain extent, acceptance is about coming to terms with um, the, what we're doing makes sense. And, and I think that reduces anxiety and all the other things that we've spoken about leading up to this part. Yeah, I think that's really important, you know, talking about vaccination. Um, for me, it's a little bit like COVID, like what do I need out of the vaccination? I want to travel again. I want to go and see my yeah. son in Italy. So, yeah. um, you know, I don't, like I said, I'm going to leave the judgment of where you are on this. Yeah. Um, but, you know, in Italy, this is, this is really interesting. Um, so my wife, and daughter and son are over there you know they've just issued green cards in Italy right. you know the last time they issued green cards in in Venice was for the plague right. I've got right. a copy of one unbelievable eh? how the world right. goes around uh, and, and look, I think that logical thing is, is really really important but I think being non-judgmental is also sure. you know yeah, absolutely um absolutely gives absolutely. you a little bit of peace yeah absolutely so Charlie, we're out of time. That was amazing. No, I, I could I could go on for another two hours. I know I'm getting free consultation, and this is wrong <laughs> of me, Charlie, but we're friends, we're friends enough. Um, yep. Just to, all those that sent in questions, I hope uh, I hope we answered them. 
Um, you know, this is a very special time for us all. I talk about, you know, I grew up with my uncle Gordon who went to war and we used to sit at the beach and, you know, he'd tell me about the war. And we're going to be talking about COVID to our grandchildren for a long, long time. And there is often no right or wrong. Sit with mm -hmm. your emotions. It's okay. Yeah. You know, it, yeah. it is what it is. So just some final thoughts for you, for our people, Sayali. Oh, look, I, um, my final thoughts would be, um, uh, you know, kindness matters. Yeah, and it matters most when um, we're under duress. And so, um, you know, it's a message that's been often used um, at the highest levels of a society, but just between you and I, yeah, it really, really matters. And, um, you know, I loved, um, I loved the informal nature of our conversation, John. I loved being able to contrib contrib contribute some, you know, some of my training into the conversation. I don't think if I was sitting here by myself talking about psychiatric things and coping with what we're coping thing, I don't think that um, it has that capacity to kind of really touch people. But by having a conversation between, you know, clearly, you know, two people that care about what's going on for ourselves and our families and our community, I think um, it, was a, it was a lovely experience for me personally. And I hope that the people that had the opportunity to give their lunch times over to listening to you and I found it valuable as well. And just the last point before we sign off, congratulations to you, mm. to everyone out there. Mm. Pat yourself on the back every day. Every at the end of each day, I go, well done, JK. Often we forget about that. You're doing awesome. Um, everyone's doing awesome just to get through it. And uh, thanks for your time. I know your time's value. I appreciate you giving us um, your time okay. during your lunchtime. And you're a beautiful man, Sayali. I love you, my friend. Uh, that's right, John. Love you back. See ya. See ya.